We've been wrong about what our job is in medicine. We think our job is to ensure health and survival, but really it is larger than that. It is to enable well-being. And well-being is about the reasons one wishes to be alive. Those reasons matter not just at the end of life or when debility comes, but all along the way. Whenever serious sickness or injury strikes and your body or mind breaks down, the vital questions are the same. What is your understanding of the situation and its potential outcomes? What are your fears and what are your hopes? What are the trade-offs you are willing to make and not willing to make? And what is the course of action that best serves this understanding? For the last five weeks, I had the privilege of rotating at the UC Davis Cancer Center in Sacramento, California, specifically in an oncology subspecialty. This video is a recap of my experience. One out of every two men and one out of every three women will be diagnosed with cancer. But despite those huge numbers, most individuals don't know what that really means. At the simplest level, cancer or cancer cells are cells that have lost the ability to follow the normal control that the body exerts on all cells. In our body, we have billions and billions of cells, and they have different functions. It's a very complicated process under incredibly phenomenal control. And if something goes wrong and that control is lost, and particular cells escape the normal control mechanisms, and they continue to grow, and they may spread, that's what we call cancer. ¿Qué onda, plebes? My name is Mario Navarro, the Mexican PA. I'm a second year PA student at UC Davis in Sacramento, California. If you find this type of content helpful, make sure you like and consider subscribing. Within the field of oncology, you have three broad categories. Medical oncology, radiation oncology, and surgical oncology. During this rotation, I work directly alongside a medical oncologist, which is the title given to a physician that is an expert in chemotherapies. Her primary clinical focus was cancer of the prostate and colorectal cancer. The field of medical oncology is very much like primary care in that you're expected to not only manage the treatment options of a patient, but also coordinate care with other oncology specialists and continue to closely monitor the patient and how they're doing over time. My schedule was typically Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, 9 to 5 p.m. and Fridays, 12 to 5 p.m. With the first two weeks, including one hour of 8 a.m. inpatient morning rounds, this meant seeing patients that were admitted to the oncology service inside the hospital and were staying, you know, overnight. As a PA student, my direct role in patient care was pretty limited, and the majority of my time on this rotation was spent shadowing, reading medical charts, and listening. I would typically show up to clinic around 30 minutes before to read up on the patient's schedule for that day, and from there I would enter into a room just like this. Typically, patients sit on the chair and rarely actually sit on the examination bed or table. It's very much a conversation and less an examination. After entering the room alone, I would proceed to ask simple questions from my patient, like, how are you doing? And ask about their symptoms that they might be experiencing, either from the cancer itself, side effects from chemotherapy, or just to inquire about any other issues that they may be having. I would do a quick review of systems, which is a quick checklist of yes or no questions to make sure they're not experiencing things like vision loss, chest pain, shortness of breath, dizziness, you get the idea. From there, I would return to the provider room and quickly give a general overview to my preceptor of the patient's progress. We would then go back in together and I would listen to the conversation between my preceptor and our patient. This type of encounter is accurately illustrated in a book entitled, When Breath Becomes Air. Two days later, Lucy and I met Emma in the clinic. My parents hovered in the waiting room. The medical assistant took my vitals. Emma and her nurse practitioner were remarkably punctual, and Emma pulled up a chair in front of me to talk face to face, eye to eye. Hello again, she said. This is Alexis, my right hand. She gestured to the NP who sat at the computer taking notes. I know there's a lot to discuss, but first, how are you doing? Okay, all things considered, I said. Enjoying my vacation, I guess. How are you? Oh, I'm okay. She paused. Patients don't typically ask how their doctors are doing, but Emma was also a colleague. I'm running the inpatient service this week, so you know how that is. She smiled. Lucy and I did know. 
Outpatient specialists rotated on the inpatient service periodically, adding several hours of work in an already jam-packed day. After more pleasantries, we settled into a comfortable discussion on the state of lung cancer research. There were two paths forward, she said. The traditional method was chemotherapy, which generically targeted rapidly dividing cells, primarily cancer cells, but also cells in your bone marrow, hair follicles, intestines, and so forth. Most of your tests are back, Emma said. You have a PI3K mutation, but no one's sure what that means yet. The test for the most common mutation in patients like you, EGFR, is still pending. I'm betting that's what you have, and if so, there's a pill called Traceva that you can take instead of chemo. That result should be back tomorrow, Friday, but you're sick enough that I've set you up for chemo starting Monday in case the EGFR test is negative. With chemo, our main decision will be carboplatin versus cisplatin. In isolated studies, head-to-head, carboplatin is better tolerated. Cisplatin has potentially better results, but much worse toxicity, especially for the nerves. Though all the data is old and there's no direct comparison with our modern chemo regimens. Do you have any thoughts? In a full clinic day, we would often see around 16 patients and the visits will last anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. I would be responsible for typing around two full progress notes per day. If I could go back in time to prepare for this rotation, I would recommend making an account with the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. This website contains the guidelines created and used by oncologists all over the country. Depending on the type of cancer your preceptor is focusing on, I would find the guideline here and look over the general treatment approach, try to familiarize yourself with the chemotherapies and the common side effects. Given that this rotation was not a core rotation, I did not have to prepare for the big end of rotation exams that you've seen me take in the past. This afforded me additional time to actually read two books for leisure. When Breath Becomes Air by neurosurgeon Dr. Paul Calanthe. And this other book, Being Mortal by Atul Gawande, also a, a surgeon. Whether you're in medicine or not, I highly recommend you read both. Between these two texts and the difficult conversations that I had the privilege of witnessing and participating in at the oncology clinic, I reflected a significant amount of time on the subject of mortality, medicine, and what matters in the end. And here are the two lessons that I found most impactful from these texts. Number one, your values are constantly changing. Kalanthi writes, the tricky part of illness is that as you go through it, your values are constantly changing. You try to figure out what matters to you and then you keep figuring it out. It felt like someone had taken away my credit card and I was having to learn how to budget. You may decide you want to spend your time working as a neurosurgeon, but two months later, you may feel differently. Two months after that, you may want to learn to play the saxophone or devote yourself to church. Death may be a one-time event, but living with terminal illness is a process. Number two was my perception of the goal of medicine. Gawande writes, Being mortal is about the struggle to cope with the constraints of our biology, with the limits set by genes and cells and flesh and bone. Medical science has given us a remarkable power to push against these limits, and the potential value of this power was a central reason I became a doctor. But again and again, I have seen the damage we in medicine do when we fail to acknowledge that such power is finite and always will be. We've been wrong about what our job is in medicine. We think our job is to ensure health and survival, but really it is larger than that. It is to enable well-being, and well-being is about the reasons one wishes to be alive. Those reasons matter not just at the end of life, or when debility comes, but all along the way. Whenever serious sickness or injury strikes and your body or mind breaks down, the vital questions are the same. What is your understanding of the situation and its potential outcomes? What are your fears and what are your hopes? What are the trade-offs you are willing to make and not willing to make? And what is the course of action that best serves this understanding? This piece of art was drawn by an anonymous cancer patient entitled The Cancer Dome. I walked by this piece every day, but stopped only on my way out of my final shift to look closely at its amazing detail. Animo Plebis.